Welcome to yet another fabulous Linux Zoo Crew, and today on the Zoo, we are going to be talking about Linux for notebooks and nettop computers. This should be an interesting discussion for those of you who are looking for a nice lightweight distribution that you can run on those machines. Before we begin our topic, today I'd like to share with you a few words from our founder, Voltam. Hi, I'm Voltam, founder of the Linux Distro community. The Linux Distro community is a place for people to hang out and discuss Linux, Linux distros, software, and open source. The Linux Distro community is a community funded by its members for its members. We are a friendly, welcoming community that encourages people who use Linux operating systems and software to share their passion and knowledge with other people. We believe that when people share information freely, everyone benefits. We'd love to see you become a part of the Linux Distro community. You can voice chat with us on Mumble or text chat with us in IRC. Head over to linuxdistrocommunity.com for details. Join in today in the sharing of knowledge and the freedom that a Linux operating system gives people. Thank you. Thank you, Voltam. And at this time, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Electro Linux, who will introduce our guests. And today we have Armageddon, Crunchy Linux, myself, Electro, Spatry, Techman, and the Linux guy. Welcome, one and all. Now, everybody on my panel, we all have notebook and net top computers of some sort, those portable little computers you take with you to the coffee shops and that sort of thing. And I just decided to install a distribution on my computer that is uh, suitable for notebook computers, namely because I run my show, uh, Spatry's Cup of Linux, from a notebook computer. I'm using a Compact Presario CQ56 single core processor, 233 gigahertz with 8 gigs of RAM. And uh, after an update, I had a little bit of breakage on my Arch system, so I decided to uh, share that uh, hard drive with Arch and Linux Mint XFCE. And let me tell you what, folks, if you haven't seen my video, on Linux Mint XFCE, you should definitely check them out. I've, uh, I'm actually going to be starting a boot camp series on that distribution, and I've got a haircut to match. So you'll definitely want to see that one. All right, and uh, let's go ahead and get started here first. Uh, let's speak with you, Armageddon. What kind of distributions would you recommend for notebook computers or netbooks? Well, first of all, hello, everyone, and... Uh... Welcome to the uh, Cup of Linux. Uh, I would I would prefer not to talk about distribution specifically. I would prefer to talk about what kind. For example, let's say if you're going with the Ubuntu, there's a whole list of uh, Ubuntu derivatives, which some of them are uh, you know uh, lightweight, others are not. So let's say Ubuntu is really heavy, so that would not work. Uh, if you go with XFC, for example, like uh, Ubuntu, that would be a good choice. Something that runs a window manager that's configured easily to be used very easily, that would be a good choice. Uh, if people have uh, more knowledge about uh, Linux in general, they can install something and build it ground up like Arch or Gentoo or um, Slackware, for example. That would be a good idea. But mainly, it, it would not be specifically a distribution, more like what kind of a desktop environment or a window manager it has. That would be a good starting point of choosing the right distribution for for you, I mean, as a lightweight distribution. Now, I know as a Gen 2 user yourself, I, I know you would definitely suggest that for power users and that sort of thing, but I, I think this focus is a little bit more for, uh, for uh, beginning or intermediate computer users who are coming over from the Windows side or the Macintosh side and that sort of thing, and I think Arch is perfect. Archer Gen 2 would be perfect for those machines, but the thing is you have to have a little bit of know-how uh, on running them. And uh, actually, I've run into quite a little bit of breakage, which uh, caused me to uh, use the uh, Mint myself. Now, let me ask you real quickly, uh, Armageddon, do you experience much breakage with Gen 2? Because I know that would be a good distribution for netbooks and, uh, uh, and laptop computers. Right. Uh, yeah, that's why I said uh, they should look at the desktop environment or window manager, not the distribution itself. I'm not talking about, you know, Arch or Gentle. I'm just talking about in general, it's not a distribution oriented more like what the distribution offers, like what window manager or what desktop environment. Choosing a light desktop environment or a very light window manager that would go with the lightweight system. 
For the Gen 2 system, I don't think he will have much breakages at all, simply because of the way the whole Gen 2 system works. The thing is, let's assume uh, a, any developer in the Gen 2 team puts a new application today in the Gen 2 tree, this application will not be eligible for stability or for stabilization up until the next month, you know, a month from now, if that application has no bug reports against it. So if it is in the tree for a month with no, absolute no bug reports against it that are not fixed or anything like that, it will be eligible to become stable on, to, on one condition that the developer himself will go and add this to the list of application that wants to be stable. And then we, for example, me as being a contributor to the Gen2 team, I go in, I check the list, I test the package, I download, I install it, compile it, install it with the, all the flags, all kinds of stuff. I do the whole testing, uh, a whole testing kind of, you know, stuff on the e-build, on the package itself, on where it installs, if it works fine, if it doesn't break anything and it should pass at least two people from the contributors then if it passes two people uh, in the contributor team as you know it's a, sta it's a stable application it can be stable then the developer himself or one of the arches you know the guys that take care of each architecture they take that application and put it in stable and then everyone can have it as stable all right very good pointers that you've given there and uh, very good uh, input uh, that that's always of comfort to know that you know if you are going to be running rolling release on a notebook or net top computer you want something that's going to be pushing out good stable uh, things uh, to you and uh, this is another reason why I am still going I I've still got that on the back burner and I do want to eventually compile Gen 2, it just said I want to have another computer with which to do that on. All right, Crunchy Linux, I saw that you uh, made a comment on uh, IRC. Uh, and this is, uh, and of course, you were speaking about uh, using Tiny Core. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's really lightweight. I mean, it only uses like 0. 0.4 megabytes of RAM. Um, and the and uh, the core version is even lighter, but that's a lot like our tree. You need to build that up. And uh, as a as a person who uses his netbook as his main computer, um, I I I like I usually like going for um, smaller distributions that use less RAM, so it will be faster. You know, like the fat, like more faster. Um, and plus, most of the distributions that are out there that are really light are uh, mostly used, or it's great for, um, can't think, it's great for, um, you, it's great for building on top of, like, I know I, I, uh, ran Crunchbang, um, and I can build on top of that and make it what I want, and I love it. All right. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I think about a week or two ago, I did a review of Tiny Core, and I think that is a really nice distribution, especially because it does load everything up into memory. Uh, about 40 megs is what it takes, I think, in memory, not 0.4 megs. <laughs> I think it's more like 40 megs, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but then again, you know, that distribution, uh, if you get their base distribution, I believe... And I could be wrong on this. Um, I do believe that um, it's a uh, well. It's only 11 megs, but you don't have any networking and that sort of thing uh, associated with it. And so, uh, I it, maybe you might have less memory being used up. But I think 40 megs is a sound idea. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the person, uh, the te Armageddon, for uh, mentioning that on IRC. All right, and uh, D Brown, tell me about Watt OS. Um, Watt OS is an Ubuntu-based distro. It is very lightweight. I have used it on my netbook. It uses LXDE and OpenBox and has the Ubuntu Software Center. Um, its like sole purpose is energy efficiency and lightweight, and it performs that very well. Uh, 120 megs of RAM. It's a 600 meg download, which is I was somewhat surprised at that, how big it is, but how light it is. It works very well, um, and it's good, just a good LXDE distribution. 
Now, interestingly enough, and by the way, Dee Brown is also a tech man. I wish he had the same name on IRC, so that kind of confused me there. <laughs> I was actually looking at Watt OS after I had my breakage in Arch, and my only caveat was that was the fact that it did not ship in a 64-bit flavor because I was looking for a lightweight distribution that I could run on my notebook computer because obviously, you know, I do a lot of really cool, fun things. I do video editing. I do 3D modeling. I do all kinds of, you know... Um, resource heavy things on my computer and so I want a desktop that will allow me to be able to have those extra resources available to those applications rather than using uh, rather than you know having all these resources being sucked up by a desktop environment or window manager or whatever that is going to you know um, use all these resources. So for that reason, I would never suggest KDE on a laptop unless you've got one of these uh, Alienware quad-core super-duper processing kind of machines uh, at your disposal. Um, but for, for us single-core users out there, and we're, yeah, super-duper, just like Econosai says, you got it. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I would never recommend... Um, recommend that now uh crunchy you wanted to talk about slight has yeah it's a great dish with only 30 megabytes uh download and it comes with pretty much everything you need but the uh packages that it comes with are like the lightest that it could be so it has its version of abby word or uh like a version of text editor uh but it's like very lightweight and so I found, I think it only uses like 60 megabytes when an application's open. And uh, it comes with like lightweight, uh, a lightweight, uh, lightweight web browser. And it it it's, uh, uses Openbox as its, uh, as its main window manager. But it's styled to look a little bit like GNOME 2, oh wait no, GNOME 3 fallback mode. And so it will be really comfortable to a new user, and um, and you can build on top of that as well. Well, I use Abby Word myself, and believe me, if I need to edit a simple text file, I am not using that. Actually, I use Kate. Uh, Kate is a text editor, a fully featured text editor, whereas Abby Word is a document editor, and I wouldn't want to use those extra resources to fire that up. Yep, and Crunchy Linux even agrees. Kate is great. She's a sexy lady, let me tell you all. And the Linux guy wants to go next. Yeah, um... What I would recommend is Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Why? It's because um, you know it's very lightweight. Um, Ubuntu. Uh, well, it's not as lightweight as LXDE, but it's pretty lightweight for what it is. And I've used. I've had a chance to use it. Um, it. I didn't use it much, though. I mean, I was. I'm not very fond of KDE, but. But for netbook users, it's great. It, it it fires up fast. It's uh, speedy. All right, and before I pass the mic over to Techman, I did want to mention something that uh, Pin Guy brought up, and this is a very sound one. He was talking about Razer QT as being a good uh, desktop to use on a netbook or uh, or net top or laptop, net top. I, I'm just getting all these names mixed up today. I actually ran that on Arch. He did admit, though, it hasn't been updated in some time, but it is very pretty to look at, and it uses very few resources and that sort of thing. And speaking of uh, another desktop environment that you may want to try uh, on, and you want to have some pretty special effects and that sort of thing, another one that doesn't use a whole lot of resources is Enlightenment 7. Seventeen. That's another nice one. Um, you don't even have to have full compositing or everything um, enabled to uh, actually use that because it has its own like software renderer in there or something. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong here on this because I haven't played with Enlightenment a whole lot, but I did get a chance to play with it from time to time. Electro. Yeah, Enlightenment does have um, software and hardware rendering and OpenGL. So yeah. Um, Enlightenment 17 is good, 
although there have been known to have quite a few bugs in the OS as well. I mean, Body Linux is probably the best, more stable Ubuntu-based distro that has Enlightenment pre-installed. Some people try and install Enlightenment from Ubuntu from the repositories, but it doesn't always work out that way. All right, Narmageddon has something to say on that. Uh, yeah, I use I use Awesome, and I find it very easy to uh, configure. But um, I found it hard to configure E17. Oddly, uh, it's probably because I I like to go down and and you know down to the bottom level and then do stuff like that. But I wanted to say a couple of things. First, the thing I wanted to say is that KDE is a hogging with everything enabled. But if you go down and disable all the if cool effects and cool changes or whatnot, it will be it will probably be close to XFCE and lightness. It is that um, configurable as a, as a desktop environment. It is hogging if you enable all the effects and stuff like that, but if you disable those, it might be light. And another thing I wanted to say uh, is, let's say we're using uh, uh, OpenCore, I think, or uh, I don't know the name, which is which takes around 40 megabytes of RAM, and then you install, let's say, Firefox, and you open Firefox, you just lost yourself 400 megabytes of RAM. So you just lost all the lightness you were working on with one browser opening it. So it, it is kind of, it, you should be looking at, at a whole system as overall. So a lightweight point of every single thing in there instead of just, you know, the whole operating system being lightweight. And then you build up everything on top of it, which is not lightweight. And then you lose all the lightweightness for nothing. Armageddon, I'm going to throw a little bit of a wrench at you. All right. Well, suppose... Okay, I've got this lightweight uh, desktop set up and everything, and I decide to run a few resource-heavy applications. What advice would you give to me if I were to shut down those applications, I'm done using them, and I want to free up all that extra memory? What would you suggest that I do? I didn't understand the question. All right, so I'm using up an extra uh, 400 megs of RAM because I decided to fire up Firefox. Okay, I'm using extra RAM because while I'm surfing with Firefox, I'm also rendering out a video in Kadian Live. Okay, the video is done rendering. I've already got it uploaded on YouTube. Okay, now I want more memory for other applications. So I close Kadian Live. I close Firefox. What would you suggest that I do to recover some extra RAM? Right, for example, I, I open two different instances of Firefox, each one in a profile, and that uses up to 1.4 megabytes of RAM. 1.4 gigabytes of RAM, I'm sorry. So 1.4 gigs of RAM, that's just for, for two browsers. If I close those, I win 1.5. So whenever I want to say, uh, if I don't have much resources and I want to give most as much as possible resources to one application i just close the rest so if i want to let's say render one of my videos on caden live i close all firefox i close my uh email client i even close stuff like uh, um pavu control because pavu control takes a lot of cpu when it's running so i close that up i close as much as possible to be able to give that application for example if i don't need the browser i just close it up if i don't need uh the email client for that 40 minutes, 30 minutes of funding, I close that up. And whenever I'm done with, let's say, um, whenever I'm done with the, the rendering of the video, I can open the browser and upload it. And let's say, if I want to watch a YouTube video, instead of using Firefox, I can go and, uh, and, and use stuff like, uh, um, you know, because uh, Adobe Flash is a, is a hog resource. It's a big hog resource. Yes, MiniTube was a good one, but I found I found it to be buggy at some points and not playing all the videos. So now I use uh, YouTube Viewer or GTK YouTube Viewer for the front end people. That's a very good. Uh, that's a that's a good way to let's say a download and it doesn't download actually. It just shows you the the video in M Player, which takes less uh, CPU and RAM. And let's say you can use mPlayer instead of VLC. It uses it's a terminal base and it uses uh, less RAM. Going going into terminal, you sh people should not be intimidated to go into the terminal. You know, uh, for specific stuff like playing videos, playing stuff like that. It would be a cool idea to use those in 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 a terminal base where they either use as less resources as possible. All right, now. Um... 
Thank you, Pin Guy, for uh, throwing this link at me. Uh, this is uh, an interesting little read. You might want to point your web browser to www.linux8myram.com, and it gives you a nice explanation uh, about this. Thank you, Pin Guy. I appreciate that. Okay, and uh, at this point, next, uh, I've got a little bit of a sweet tooth. So, Tech Man is going to tell us a little bit about Peppermint OS. Thank you, Spatry. First of all, I forgot, thought you forgot about me, but I see that not not true. Uh, Peppermint OS is another lightweight Ubuntu-based distro, uh, LXDE. It is themed very nicely. Uh, it uses the software manager that uh, Linux Mint uses, and it's actually very nice, very lightweight. It comes with Firefox pre-installed, if I'm correct. Uh, if you wanted another lightweight browser, you could get something like Midori, which is really lightweight and really nice, actually. So, yeah. Okay, and here's another good distribution that nobody even thought to brought up. Ping Guy has one called Pingy. And I actually have that running on uh, one of my roommate's uh, netbook computers. And um, it's running great. And the thing I like about Pingai OS is pretty much he's taken the best of Ubuntu, the best of Linux Mint, and a few other little, uh, uh, you know, bits of technologies that are out there that, um, you know, he just puts together and he has everything working and singing together well. So if you are using a netbook computer and you want to have the definitive Linux experience, you may definitely want to tr check out Pingy. That is P I N G E E E. Information is available on that distribution on Pingy OS's forums. Okay, Crunchy Linux, you're next. Uh, I wanted to add on to Terminal. There's a lot of great applications like Elinks. I use to read um to read my um to read like news pages and uh there. I think there is a way that you can get uh YouTube videos working in there. Also, there's a lot of great terminal clients for like mail and uh, radio and mp3 players, so there, if you have those applications, then you can pretty much do everything in the terminal and it uses up a lot less RAM. Alright. Lectro, we haven't heard from you. Linux rules. Um, I've used of course of it does. I've used plenty of distros on the, on a laptop. I know it's not a netbook, but you know, it's only got 4 gig of RAM and a dual card processor. Um, Ping Guy works quite well, but like Ping Guy was saying before, he likes to allocate a lot of stuff into RAM because, uh, as everyone knows, who, who definitely runs Linux, that RAM is a lot faster than your hard drive. So people think that using RAM is a bad thing, but if it's not being used up by all all your pro all your actual programs, um, you do find that your system does run better when there's when it's being given uh, more RAM usage. Um, it only seems to be Windows that has that issue where you use a lot of RAM and things start slowing down. Um, there's loads of lightweight distros like Tiny Core and Puppy Linux and Saluki and all the rest of them, but um, Ping iOS and um, X Ubuntu and like the one you're using, Linux Mint XFCE Edition, don't run a lot on RAM. And surprisingly, when I'm running on um, Linux Mint 13 KDE, it's only using half a gig at idle, so it's not that much of a RAM hogger for me. Now, I just did a check um, while we've been having this discussion. I've got 8 gigs of RAM installed on my system, and I'm only using 820 megs of it. Um, and that's with my recordings going on, I've got XChat running, I've got Mumble running, and I've got a few other applications also running in the background, which really isn't using that much. But the really nice thing I like about this is the fact that this is running snappy. I click a link to open up an application, and it opens quickly without waiting a long time for it to load up. Ping Guy also made a wonderful point on um, our free-for-all show last week that we had afterwards where... Um, where he was talking about having applications load into memory. This is a wonderful concept because this is something you also see in Puppy Linux. This is why those distributions run so quickly is because applications are being loaded up into memory. And as uh, Pingai had stated before, and you just said, uh, Electro, you know, uh, RAM is faster than your hard drive is. And so if you want extra kick in performance, I think that's the way you really want to go. So I'd have to agree with that. 
And uh, Techman did mention that the system does go slower when you use swap, but when you have as much memory as I have on a system, I have yet to see my computer actually go into swap mode. I, it, you know, from from many different distributions. From uh, when I first started using uh, Linux, I used uh, Linux Mint. Then I moved on to Pingai OS. Then I moved on to uh, Arch Linux, and now I'm back to my roots again. I'm running Linux Mint. And you know what? I never see it using up any swap. I mean, uh, it's kind of funny. I feel like I should just remove the swap drive altogether since it's not using it. But I, I think it. there are some points where swap is used. I've just never noticed it. All right, Armageddon, you're next. Um, I want to talk about a bit of uh, hard drive and RAM. RAM is is uh, random access memory, which is basically whatever is on RAM when you turn off your computer, it's it's over, it's done, it's dead. Hard drive, everything is on on the everything on the hard drive is still on the hard drive when you turn off your computer, so it's saved there. RAM is smaller than hard drives, of course, as everyone knows, but it is uh, up to a hundred times faster than the hard drive. So using the hard drive is slow, and using the RAM is fast. Not as fast as the CPU and cache, but it is fast. Now, the, the whole point of, of using as less RAM as possible is not because of the idea of using RAM is bad. Using RAM is, is extremely good and it should be used. But what we're talking about is the fact that if a lot of applications are using the RAM, at some point, a new applications that are, uh, that are gonna get open, they're not gonna have a place in the RAM and they're gonna get swapped and swap mean, you, means use, being used by the, on the hard drive, which makes them slower and makes the whole system slower because they're going to have to wait to those applications to cash in and cash out. So the, the whole idea of using RAM is not a bad idea. It's how much RAM you have and what are you using it for. That's, that's the whole point of having a lightweight distribution. Uh, let's say you have, uh, uh, you know, the thing about RAM is that Whenever you open an application, most of the data of that application will get copied from the hard drive up to the RAM. That's why it takes time to load it. But then when it's open, it's open. It's, it runs really fast because it's running from the hard drive. And it goes slow at, at a point where the operating system has to go back to the hard drive and read stuff from it. That's when it goes slower. But the thing is, it depends on how much RAM you have and what are you using it for? How are you managing, let's say you have four gigs of RAM, how are you managing your four gigs upon all the applications you have and how much each application needs? And you should keep all the applications running on the, the minimum amount of RAM to leave for, for other applications uh, some, some RAM to, 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 you know, to swap to, to cache to. All right, thanks for that history, uh, Armageddon. Now, at this point, let's shift focus just a little bit because we are running shorter on time here. Um, I went and I asked Pin Guy a little bit about power management. Okay, now he includes a program called Jupiter, which allows you to get a little bit uh, better push on your uh, laptop computer so that, you know, your battery, you know, your battery is you know uh, not using as much power when it's obviously not plugged in and that sort of thing um, and uh, he actually suggests using that but there are also other features in other different Linux distributions that allow you to scale your CPU whether you realize that you're scaling it or not such as uh, using you know setting the CPU on demand that sort of thing. Uh, Lectro was just asking me if I'm using Jupyter now. No, I'm not because I always keep my notebook plugged in. Even when I take it with me to the coffee shop, I always bring my uh, power supply with me and just plug it in on one of the power strips. I very rarely even run it on battery. But for those of you who are running uh, your computer on battery, having Jupyter installed could be a benefit to you. Uh, Armageddon? Um, yes, I want to talk about that. Well, the first thing uh, everyone needs to know is that scaling is supported by the kernel itself. So you have multiple kinds of, uh, let's say, profiles. You have, a, like, like on 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 other operating system, you have, you have the ability to choose performance versus uh, battery life or whatever. Well, those are supported by the kernel itself. So you go in the kernel and then enable those and enable whatever profiles you want. 
Now, what, what you can do all of that manually in any Linux system without even needing Jupyter. So you can go down and scale your CPU to 50%, 100%, 25%, or even use a profile for that. But the thing is that, that applications like Jupyter give you is that the ability of the automated kind of turning on and off uh, stuff that you're not using, like the Bluetooth, let's say, or the Wi-Fi or stuff like that. So that's a good idea to save battery power because Wi-Fi takes a lot of battery power. Um, the screen takes a lot of battery power. Uh, the actually uh, the brightness on the screen takes battery power. So lots of those kind of stuff uh, do take uh, power. So applications like Jupyter turn them on and off uh, automatically. You can do that manually, of course, in Linux, just like any other thing. But the thing is, as well, is that. Um, the Linux kernel did not support much, uh, 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 you know, stuff like that. It didn't support battery life and 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 management, power management, up until very recently, where it went, uh, when you know, when Linux started being very popular on the laptop and netbooks and stuff like that. So I think it it was 3.3 or 3.2 or 3.4. I'm not really sure, but they did make a breakthrough. By, by adding new code for power management in the Linux kernel, making it uh, use less battery, and now I, I, I won around 20 minutes of battery power after that, battery life, actually. Okay, now, interestingly enough, and uh, Pin Guy just brought this up, he actually had a good article, and I think he still does have a good article on Granola on his uh, forum, and he's also posted a link here that is HTTP colon forward slash forward slash grano g-r-a-n-o dot l-a forward slash and that'll give you all the information that you need on granola enterprise power management software for your system it's nice for the beginning users though to be able to have things like granola and jupiter to manage their power manage you know to handle their power management that uh, armageddon just pointed out is uh, run by the kernel it, it's good that people have those options to be able to uh, make those changes graphically rather than having to hit a command line. Okay, and then we had another topic we were going to discuss this week as well, and we're going to talk about Wi-Fi. A lot of people have issues with Wi-Fi on their notebook computers and nettop or netbooks, and... Uh, a lot of this can be attributed to the fact that the technology is always moving. You know, there's always new uh, Wi-Fi components that are being shipped on these computers, and the Linux kernel has not adapted to provide support for those. And uh, one thing that we do have is the NDIS wrapper. Personally, I have never tried it, because all of my Wi-Fi has always seemed to work quite well. Um, on all of my notebooks and the thing is uh, I did have one device that was a USB that did not have kernel support but then I found that when I upgraded my kernel then all of a sudden it started to work beautifully for me so that is an option um, does anybody have anything on the NDIS wrapper it doesn't look like anybody on my panel has had uh, much uh, with that um, and I have really never had a need to try it out but ping guy did also put up a a uh, link for um, a QR code generator for Wi-Fi, and that is at blog.qr4.nl/qr-code-wi-fi.aspx. All right. Well, at this point, Armageddon has something else he would like to share. Yeah, I would like to talk about the Wi-Fi and other drivers' problems, but specifically Wi-Fi because those are the most most common these days. It's I I, I wouldn't give the I, I wouldn't say it's the Linux problem. It's not the operating system problem. It's basically the the manufacturers who create these Wi-Fi cards and then ship them out, but they don't care enough to write their uh, drivers either in the Linux kernel and give them to the people that code the, the Linux kernel or as firmware's outside in, in, in binary blobs uh, they don't care much to do that so they just you know they keep it up to the community and sometimes the community has problems trying to reverse engineer them and find drivers for them that would be the main problem for those I would say uh, I, I was blessed with uh, with a real tech that works but some people have real tech that do not work some people have 
other stuff. But the most, uh, what, what I would suggest is that people should go with the uh, wireless cards that are supported by their companies. Let's say um, Intel supports their, their, their VGA drivers very well and they do support uh, their wireless drivers uh, as well. Uh, Realtek supports some of them real good. All their stuff are, are bad. Yeah, some people have issues like Pinkass, some people had issues with Realtek, others I didn't have any issues with Realtek myself. Uh, it's my card works fine. So it is, de it, it depends on the company itself and how much they're offering from their time and, and effort to give drivers and firmers to the Linux community and the Linux kernel. All right, good stuff there, Armageddon. And at this point, folks, we have run out of time. I would like to take this time to thank Armageddon, Crunchy Linux, Electro Linux, Tech Man, and the Linux Guy for joining me on this episode. Today's show was brought to you by the Linux Distro Community. Visit us today at linuxdistrocommunity.com and chat with us on Mumble or in IRC on the Freenode Network in the Linux Distro Community channel. The Linux Distro Community, freedom through the sharing of knowledge. All right, I'd like to thank all of you for a wonderful show, and I'd like to thank everybody in the listening room. Now, everybody from the listening room has moved into a, a room. We've got the mics open, so now everybody can participate in this conversation. Uh, this is the uh, post-show chat uh, that goes along with uh, notebooks and net tops discussion that we've just had. And I'm going to let let the uh, timer run for about 20 minutes. So everybody gets a chance to share uh, their views and opinions on different distributions and different technologies that they're using on notebook and net top computers. So please, everybody, enjoy the post-show conversation. First of all, I wanted to say that when I signed up for the show tonight, I... I wasn't planning on talking much because I didn't have much to talk about, but it turns out I did, so if I talk too much, I'm sorry for the others. We'll get you a muzzle for next week's show. It's alright, you run Gen 2, so it's good. <laughs> well, I do twinkle a lot in the actual kernel, so I know it's, you know, I know it's, it, I know the small tiny bits and pieces in there, so I, I know what is where and, and how to enable it and disable it, so I know some of those stuff. And I did take operating system class, so I know how the whole operating system works and stuff like that. So I do have some knowledge, some background knowledge about the topic. Hey, Spertree, I know I'm this a... is... Hey, Pin Guy, how you doing, buddy? I was just going to say, yeah, not too bad. I'm again, I was going to say the same. I pretty much had no opinion about lightweight desktops, but the minute you started talking, I thought I should post links about, especially with the kernel stuff, with the power management and stuff, stuff that I'm quite familiar with. So I was kind of shocked. That how much that you sort of talked about in the in the actual show that I could give you links and information about. So yeah, I actually probably spoke a lot more, not spoke but gave links a lot more info than I actually thought I would know. And of interest to everybody, I will have all of those links that Pin Guy was gener generous enough to provide to us in the show notes so that you can check those out for yourself. There's a lot of good documentation that you can uh, read up on. Spetry, uh, I was also thinking maybe you could put like Puppy Linux links in there. Yeah, I'll put a link to Justin Bieber Linux for all the uh, Justin Bieber fans out there. Well, Linux ate my RAM. <laughs> zero of us. <laughs> Pinkas, I would have wished you were on the show. You had you had lots of things to say, and I I, I do actually have a problem with uh, talking about specific distributions as being lightweight because um, it's not it's not always about the distribution itself. Although distribution helps sometimes, how how it's how it's developed, it helps on being lightweight or or heavyweight, but. Um, it is more of what kind of software they're using as well, what kind of uh, software they're offering, what kind of desktop environment they're offering, what kind of window manager they're offering. So let's say if you see uh, a distribution that offers KDE, you'd know directly that, hey, this is not a lightweight. This is for sure not a lightweight. This is a heavyweight distribution. I was actually... I what, was, what was that one Linux? Sorry, oh. again, I no, go ahead, Pinga. It's all I got quickly. Yeah. I'm again, I completely agree because it doesn't really matter what desktop environment I'm running. In the background, I'm actually running quite a few server type uh, applications. I've got a few things for like uh, so I can view all my videos, pictures, not on my Android device. So I've actually got 
quite a few running processes in the background so it doesn't really matter how lightweight my desktop environment is the stuff I'm running is pretty heavy weight let me throw a wrench into this machine I personally think it's up to the end user because I mean it doesn't matter how lightweight your desktop environment or window manager is you know depending on what applications you decide to install on your system that you're going to be using regularly will determine how bloated it's going to be well the thing is i love subsonic i mean if no one's familiar with it subsonic is it's not a free or even open source program but it runs beautiful on linux uh, subsonic is a server program that you can run on your computer where you can stream stuff to other computers. You basically get like a little website and you can go onto it and then you can watch films and it will be done in Flash and it will like encode it and encrypt it and all that on the fly on your system. But the thing is, Subsonic doesn't matter what desktop environment you run on top of it, it's quite a heavy program. I mean, I would have to agree. I mean, I, I talked about this. I mean, if you're using a, a 40 megabyte uh, using RAM operating system and then you install Firefox, you just lost yourself 500, 600 megabytes of RAM. So, it's it, it yes, it's it it kind of comes down to the distribution itself. But again, if you're gonna run um, servers in the background, if you're gonna run heavy applications, you're gonna lose those RAMs like like that, like really fast. Armageddon. Yes. I'm not sure what's wrong with your Firefox, but my Firefox only uses about a hundred megs at most. I think it's. Uh, I think he, get a... I think he's trying to make a point. No, no. Actually, my actually my Firefox. I have have uh, one of them has over fifteen tabs open. I have over ten to fifteen add-ons. I have scripts running. I have a bunch of stuff running. So it it and actually Pentadactyl as well uses a bit a bit stuff because it runs on you know by itself as another application so it, it is kind of uh, it, it, it can get uh, hogging as you know depending on how much you use it and if you're using let's say if you open one only tab and then open a uh, flash in it you just lost yourself 60% uh, of the CPU power yes. yeah but how about having uh, as PDQ suggested how about having 20 tabs open and having 40 extensions installed on your browser? Of course, all of those extensions are going to use up uh, some of your uh, CP, you know, it's going to use up some of your resources as well. And I mean, I'm experiencing that right now with Firefox. I've got a lot of extensions installed on it, and I actually have to go through and start removing a few of them because Firefox sometimes is just a CPU hog on my system. Just right, what? Right, I it, 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 that on my laptop. Well, it can get it can get heavy. That's what I'm saying. It can get heavy very easily. You, you don't, for example, every time I install my system, I say to myself, "This is going to be a lightweight system," and I end up using two to two, three three gigs of RAM by applications I install by you know one application from here, one application from there, and you know just they just eat up RAM, and uh, it comes down to. Uh, poorly coded add-ons sometimes, uh, add-ons that need a lot of CPU to work, a lot of calculations, uh, tabs need a lot of calculations. It, it all depends on, on a lot of factors, so you cannot point a finger on it like, you know, say this is this is it, but one small thing after the other, you're going to start losing your, your, your RAM space that like that. Yes, but, but for example, like a person who does not use a whole lot of extensions, if they, it, and it's basically a just fresh install. It it won't use that much RAM. It will probably only use at least a hundred megs, maybe less, maybe like a little less. I'm a getting you are absolutely awesome, and you've just nailed the problem right on the head. If you're on a lightweight desktop, it doesn't really matter about what desktop environment you're running. It's basically what you're running in the background, what programs you got, and what you're using. I mean. Anyone can run a lightweight desktop environment. I mean, yeah, I could put XFCE and install no programs. But I can install XFCE, but the minute I start installing programs like Samba and other things that they're not particularly resource heavy by themselves, but the minute they are with other programs that start using a lot of resources, you've basically got a very I'm not going to say heavy operating system because that's a lie. It's because a lot, a lot of stuff with Linux is very modular, so it's very efficient and quite lightweight. 
but the minute you want to start doing something a little bit more complex a little bit more involved with Linux you've got to start installing these programs and the minute you've got half a dozen running processes it all you know it all increases and you're going to have an operating system that's got a lot of things running in the background I mean, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with the, with Ping guy. For example, for me, I sometimes I look at my CPU percentage and it goes up to 80. I'm like, what? 80? I have nothing open. And I go back and look at my task manager and uh, and I look, it's like 5% in here, 10% in there, 10% in there, and 10% in there. And then it all adds up to 80%. And sometimes you have, you have uh, those uh, backhand daemons like let's say pulse audio for example so what at one point i got amazed by what happened i i closed every single application i looked at my memory usage and it was 1.7 gigs i'm like i have nothing left anymore i closed every single one i still have like a terminal open it shouldn't take 1.7 gigs uh and then i i i killed pulse audio and at that point it went down to 800 I mean, it lost half of them, even not more, because my, my laptop has been running for over seven to eight days, and it's been running on Pulse Audio, and Pulse Audio kept swapping my RAM, using my RAM one after the other for, for stuff that I didn't need anymore. And then it, 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 it's used up to 800 to 900 more megabytes of RAM just for Pulse Audio, which is a sound daemon. Just quick thing, zombie processors. When you run in your system for over a week, that's something that you have to you have to like work out not work out but something you're going to face zombie processors processors and it's something i'm trying i'm actually trying to work out a way to kill out zombie processors because even when you close the program it's still running in the background as a zombie and it, oh yeah that's a, that's a whole different conversation a whole different topic but yeah there, there is still issues and there's still things we as a community need to sort out and this is one of them you can use a kill switch 9 on the uh, program, that'll shut it down if you can find all the processes. HTOP is excellent for that. Yeah, HTOP. Yeah, by the way, but uh, uh, if it's a zombie, uh, if it's a zombie uh, process, you cannot kill it by kill dash 9. The dash 9 will not kill it at all. If it's running, yes, you will be able to kill it, but if, if it's not, uh, you won't be able to kill it. And that comes down to poorly coded applications as well. I've, I I used one, uh, I had a project at school and we were testing the efficiency of a Windows server versus a, a Linux server and I used Ubuntu for that, uh, Apache server to be specific. And this application was kind of a pen testing application or um, not, not a pen testing application, it was more of um, a load testing application so it loads the server with requests one after the other and that application was written in Java. and. To be honest with you, it was poorly written. It used to crash a lot, and when it crashes, it opened a bunch of zombie, uh, uh, a bunch of zombie processes that I could not kill. I had to reset my system to uh, free up that that those processes, the uh, and the memory they're using. Okay, now I have a question. Um, I know when I was using Windows, I had uh, there there are many different programs that'll go ahead and scrub RAM of uh, any programs that you previously had running and that sort of thing. And I know BleachBit also has a feature, but it's experimental for cleaning out your RAM when you run that. But do any of you know of any Linux applications that would work for cleaning out RAM? Or is that just something that's not available to us yet? I wouldn't know of such application. I, I, I honestly don't don't have a clue if there's an application for that on Linux or not. I'm not going to say there isn't, and I'm not going to say there is. Uh, that's to be honest. But the thing is, if, uh, if you look at your processes, you can see which ones are using RAM and which ones aren't. And then if, if any of one of them is, is, let's say, is frozen or it's, it, for, some, for some reason it stopped working and it froze or, or it stopped responding and stuff like that, this application will take sometimes a lot of RAM. And killing it will just free RAM that fast. So closing an application or killing an application that's not been used that would free RAM. I, the thing is, Linux doesn't quite work the same as Windows when it comes to RAM. It, it doesn't quite even work the same as Android. Android's got a, quite an interesting way of it does it. It, it sort of has like 400, gig, um, 400 megabytes and then 200 megabytes and like for certain tasks, so idle, using and stuff. And Linux kind of works in a similar way, actually. Um, so 
You, you can't kill off a Linux task because if you kill it off, it could interrupt other tasks. So what it does is like um, when it hits underneath a certain, you know, when it's using less processing power, or whatever, when it let's say it's idle, it gets put into the idle section, but it's still running. But that idle section has been given, let's say, 400 megabytes. But it's all, it's all, it's it's all relevant, relevant to how much RAM you've got. That's why RAM is very, very different to how RAM is used in Linux to how it's used in Windows. In Windows, the program just uses that much amount. None of it's dedicated, but in Linux, you have sections. You have like idle RAM processors, you have blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. It's slightly different. Uh, here's something of a little bit of interest. Uh, my server has been running for seven days. Um, I have the desktop environment running on it, even though I'm not even using it. But um, everything that boots up when the system boots up um, is running. And I'm using 121 megs out of the 1 gig of RAM that it, I have in this server. And it's working fine. It's been running for seven days. Yes, but once you start using it and those applications run and you, and do specific tasks and fast attacks, and if you use Pulse Audio for a long time, this will start using lots of RAM. And what Ping Guy talked about is kind of uh, going more into depth about the Linux kernel. I would love to talk about that, but it would be a whole show all by itself talking about the operating how the kernel space and the user space and how the queuing system of the processes work and how how the whole system works because I've I've had I've had my my uh, my hands fiddle with the Linux kernel to be honest, and it was in the operating system uh, course as well. And we had to recode the kernel to use different kinds of uh, um, scheduling system for the processes. Uh, it is yes, the Windows the Windows versus Linux system worked very differently in using uh, the user space and the uh, kernel space and the RAM. And how they manage, uh, how how they kind of manage the uh, processes working, and how how you know how much time it gives each one. Well, this certainly gives me a bunch of food for thought because I'm actually going to uh, do a little bit of research on this and uh, see what kind of things I can find out about uh, memory because that's sort of a gray area for me. But uh, I know this would be of great interest to a lot of people. Um, if they knew a little bit more about how memory management can work in a Linux system. Well, that's the thing. Linux management for memory is completely different. It's not even close or even resembling the same as how Windows works. It's completely different. So people, yeah, I mean, because the thing is, people get scared off, they sort of say, but the thing is, you need to, you need to be able to look out for memory leaks. Uh, Linux, unfortunately, how as good as it is, there is still memory links with pro uh, memory leaks with programs. You've got to be able to, you know, diagnose that. So you sort of say, because it, it, you know, if after two days you have got eight gigs of RAM, let's say, like after two days and it's using it's using all your memory, you've got a memory leak somewhere. Um, that anything from a Python program to anywhere. So you've got to look at the Python program and then you've got to look at the resources and the relevant sort of tasks that it's running and work out which one has got a memory leak. It's not particularly, it's it's a little bit difficult, but when you got an eye and you understand it, you can spot it out straight away. But yes, you know, I can't say Linux is perfect when it comes to memory links because I'll be lying. Linux is pretty good with, no, no, Linux is the best operating system in the bloody world. Sorry, cut that, I will say it. Linux is the best operating system in the world when it comes to managing memory. But even as good as it is, there is still memory leaks with it. I would agree. I would agree. When I when I took the Linux, the operating system course, we talked about the Linux system, we talked about the Windows system, and we talked about um, the Unix system overall. Uh, yes, Linux is not perfect. Everyone knows that. Actually, there's uh, anyone that says I have an application that's perfect, they're lying. There's no perfect application. There is no perfect application out there. And the Linux kernel is, an, is by itself an application. It is a kernel, but it is an application. It's running on top of the CPU. Uh, but the thing is, they are, there are challenges to how much you can do with how much the efficiency is going to be uh, uh, is going to be lost. For example, there are some tasks like um, there are some tasks in the, in the Linux kernel, for example, that other uh, operating systems 
uh, care about and they go hey we should take care of this and then they lose a, a lot of code on that that would take a lot of resources to do when in the Linux uh, kernel they go you know what this is this happens so rarely so whenever it happens we just drop it we don't care about it and that would make it more efficient not perfect but more efficient than other operating systems even though what they're doing other operating systems are doing stuff to recover from it the Linux kernel just drops it and those are very small kind of stuff that no one even uh, cares or, or, or you don't even notice them when you're running a system but they do happen and they do happen very rarely but they do happen and they don't cause the system any any problems because of the way they are managed or not managed uh, at some points so it it, it 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 all comes down in my opinion to uh, how much you uh, how much you wanna use resources to do certain stuff that are not important or that are important so I would you know some people would prefer to give uh, a bunch of codes to something to some things that are very important but just keep it for others all right at this point we are almost out of time folks does anybody have any final thoughts um i would like to thank everyone yeah, that's... Going... go on yeah, again. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah so i would like to thank everyone and uh i'm again and there's conversation with calf but i would like to carry on conversation with because this is something i'm dealing with at the moment and we seem like we're both sort of dealing with it and i've enjoyed this conversation and i would like this to continue Thank you, Binga. I've enjoyed the conversation as well very much, and I hope uh, I, I I hoped you were with us in the uh, in the studio when we were recording the show. You would have uh, helped a lot uh, with your insight, and I would like to thank everyone that's wa that that watches the show and has been watching it, and will watch the show in the future. And I would invite everyone to join us next week. The next rules. And yeah, yeah. and by the way, thank you, Spatry, for the show and for all the work you're doing. And I'd like to thank everybody as well. And again, today's guests were Tech Man, the Linux Guy, Electro, Armageddon, and uh, Crunchy. And I'd also like to thank you, Pin Guy, for joining us for the post -co post show conversation. We have this show every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, uh, join us again next week. We'll have another hot topic, and uh, we'll have another uh, post show conversation afterwards. Uh, I really enjoy these and I think uh, the post-show conversations, you know, just add a little bit more depth to the show. So I'd like to thank thank all of you for uh, jumping in and joining us in this show. And I'd also like to thank Baltim and the Linux distro community for hosting us. Well, that's all that we have for now. We'll see you in the same time, same channel next week.